Hey everybody, welcome back. This is part two, and in part one, we assembled, we primed, and then we painted this fella, the kitty cat known as the White Giga Lion from Kingdom Death. And if you missed out on that and you wanted to see how it got painted or put together or any of that fun stuff, then uh, feel free to check out the card and it'll link you to it. Otherwise, uh, you can look at the playlist, you can look at uh, the rest of the channel. There's lots of ways to find it by clicking on my name and going from there. So today we're going to be doing a different type of painting, a different type of assembly. It is important to me to play this game, which is very large, in a smaller format so that I can very quickly and easily bring it to the table and put it away. And I don't like moving a 40, 50 pound box full of cards and all that kind of stuff and worrying about the plastic figures and trying to set up big uh, shelving arrangements, glass deals. I know a lot of people like doing it and they like showing off their stuff. For me, I've got so much, I just would rather it be protected and be able to pull it out to play with it because I'm more of a person that wants to play my games as opposed to just showing off the, the paintwork. I'm a mediocre painter at best, so um, if I was much better and I was doing full dioramas, then maybe the glassware would make sense, but for me, this is what I do. I make boxes, and they're all basically the same. They're all jet black. They're all made out of some form of wood, be it MDF or regular plywood, whatever the case is, and I line them with black felt so that it doesn't tear at or stick to or pull at any of the figures and if there is any vibration or anything like that as a result of being moved then the felt absorbs a lot of that shock and it doesn't end up breaking the delicate figures on my fade on my lonely tree on all kinds of stuff that i've bought with uh, kingdom death i had foam previously that would stick to the delicate parts and tear them right off whenever I wanted to take it out and use it and that upset me greatly and I decided that this would be the format I would use and instead of having the foam stick to things possibly rubbing paint off grabbing at the uh, delicate plastic I would instead have air and air seems to work just fine it's very well protected as you can see I make labels in the front so you can tell which box it is from the many black boxes that exist and everything I need to play fits inside here. So you can see I gave it room for the lion, the four figures, and there's even a compartment on the bottom for the cards just for the Giga Lion, because I might not always want to use it, but I do want to keep it. And I have other videos about how to build these boxes on the channel, you can check on the playlist, and it doesn't go quite in depth like it does here because this is a subscriber special, so I decided to do some more stuff. First things first, break out all the pieces you want to store. As you can see, I've got the cards laid out in a certain way, I've got uh, the figures, and I've got the wood that I want to use, but I don't know if I really can use it just yet. So what you do is, you put it kind of in the stack that you want to set it up as and see if you have enough room. Uh, one of the things to keep in, in mind, you, for me, maybe not for you, but for me, I make an outer box and an inner box. So if you want to do what I do, then you need to account for the space that's going to be used by the outer box, which means you can't use all of um, the room inside of that sheet of MDF for the inner box. You're going to have to make it a little bit smaller. So as things get a little spaced, the uh, MDF itself in this instance is one eighth of an inch or three millimeters. I have to account for not only the three millimeters width that the outsides will be, but also tolerance of at least a millimeter. I go for about a sixteenth of an inch just to make sure everything fits about right once it's all glued together and that seems to be the right amount for me um, based on my table saw and all that other um, things that I've done knowing that uh, it's gonna it's gonna take off some it's gonna be a little bit imprecise if you have a laser cutter or something like that then maybe you can get it perfect 
but for me my tolerance level is about a sixteenth of an inch all around that's generally the smallest amount I can measure on the table saw and it is gonna fit pretty snug no matter what by the time I get to the end so I'm gonna just kinda look around and take some measurements of the thing I want you can do this same process for everything you own doesn't matter what it is I've got a bunch of uh, numbers as you can see on the yellow pad from previous attempts from previous things I've, I've created and it gives me an idea of what pieces I've used and if I have to move to the thicker uh, I think it's a quarter inch thick uh, MDF that I have it's very heavy I don't want to use that if I can avoid it I want to use this much smaller stuff because it's cheaper and um, it's it's lighter and all around better uh, for this application so it looks like I'm able to fit everything uh, about how I want. I've got a plan in mind. I want the uh, Giga Lion itself to sit into a, a compartment, and then I want compartments for the four survivors that go along with the vignette. As you can have previously seen in the little preview graphic from a few minutes ago, I was able to achieve this. <laughs> so have a plan, whatever that plan is. It doesn't matter what it is. Just keep it in mind what you want to do. Some things to consider when um, you are creating something like this. The width of the cards. You don't really want to have it be a lot of space because things are just going to rattle around. You only really want enough space to get your finger in there and that's it. Um, a little bit, maybe uh, an eighth of an inch tolerance should be enough for you to just tilt any of the cards out and that'll be fine and you know you can build it from there uh, as you can see I'm drawing directly onto the piece of wood this piece of wood here is my idea piece it's kinda sacrificial I will try to use it in another part of the build um, but right now it's just giving me the ideas of if I can fit it onto this piece. I'm going kind of slow here just to show you a few of the things I did. I know I have to miter the edges, which means I'm going to set them at a 45 degree. I will draw the in a certain pattern the uh, sections and edges that I, I need to do the miter to. I just do little loop-de-loops and shade it in. This is a time-consuming process and I'm sure there's a better one if there's a carpenter out there that has a system they use all the time. Follow them. I don't know uh, how other people do it. This just is how I do it. Anything I do, if there is a better way of doing it and someone who's better at it, follow the way they do it. Uh, the same thing I said when I was putting the lion together. I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I just managed to finish it. And I keep all my fingers. I keep all my toes. Uh, I, I did get stabbed in the last video, but you know that's healed since. Um, and it is effectively painted. Now is it expertly painted? No. It's effectively painted and that's uh, what I'm kinda going for. If uh, there are other people out there that have a better vision of how to accomplish the uh, the task that you want to put forward for yourself, follow them. I'm not arguing one way or another and I'm never gonna argue in the comments because I'm just too tired to do that. Um, but any safety things that you can do, I'll put up front, you should do them. I probably will not do them. That means I am incorrect and the people who are telling you to do the safety things are correct. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm still keeping my fingers and I'm going to accomplish the goal of making the box. So I have to get that part out of the way. Um, why black? Because that's the color of Kingdom Death and all of the stuff inside will be black as well and it's also easy to get black felt and I like it with the adhesive backing it makes things a little easier and it will also allow me to cover up all of my pencil marks that you see me putting in here so I don't care whatever I'm gonna draw on there whatever mistakes I'm gonna make it's either gonna get covered in black paint or felt so if you plan that in to the process, you won't have too many things to worry about if you make a mistake. And I make a ton of mistakes, I just keep going anyway. And that's uh, a general philosophy of myself. 
don't get too hard on little things that might stop you from doing a big thing. So here I am, I'm adding in the width of the materials of the outer box. I'm adding in my tolerance space of a 16th of an inch, three millimeters, and I'm adding in the width of the inner box so that I have an idea if I can accomplish, of if I can accomplish, try to get the grammar right, Joe, um, the goal of making this box work. So let's speed up the process. Uh, I had to turn away from the camera for whatever reason. Maybe I went to get some water, um, but that's it. Just keep figuring out where your your lines are, where your miters are going to be, and if you have the right amount of material. Once I have the basic map of the top piece, then I will start making considerations for everything around it. Now I am going to do a miter for the outsides, but I'm going to do something called a dado for the insides. And I'm going to allow, uh, a dado is a slot basically that you see in um, cabinets and other things. Lots, It's a simple deal, but it's also easy to do on the table saw and I'll show you how I end up doing that. Uh, probably in a very unsafe way, but you know, I'm sure there's a carpenter that'll tell you better. Um, the, uh, the reason for the dado is it will be stronger as it will create, a, the, like I said, a slot that the, the shelf that holds the models will act as a structural um, component and the um, it'll hold better that way. Um, the tops of the box is a structural component holding everything and keeping everything from getting damaged and the bottom is pretty strong. The bottom is where the cards will be and that makes it so that the um, top part is accessible. I can pull the models out easy. Uh, you could, if you wanted, flip the cards on their sides and uh, add an extension that way. Uh, whatever your plan, whatever you like for your, the way you want to lay it out is up to you. You won't have to dado anything uh, or much of anything, just one a little rib if uh, that's what you want to do. But for me, because I'm going to use the, the models, I'm going to have uh, some complicated uh, structure set up with the dados. And I've moved over into a clean piece of wood and I'm now creating from that map of the first piece, I'm creating the next um, piece that I'm actually going to use. So it's the exact same uh, measurements and everything like that. It just has all the notes uh, not on it. And there I go, filling everything in. So there's three sides, see how it fits. I'm checking everything right now just to make sure it'll fit all the components. Um, three sides will have a miter, one will not. I like keeping one straight side and that will allow me to make everything referenced off of that straight cut. I'm gonna assume that the manufacturer made straight cuts when they created it on their, their big old machines and that my cuts I'm gonna assume are wonky. So I'm gonna try to maintain as many manufacturer cuts as possible and edges as possible so that I can maintain the rest of it being nice and straight. So always measure, 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 measure over and over and over again, even if it seems stupid and ridiculous. Every little time you do something, keep measuring. Uh, it's not gonna come out exactly as you measured it no matter what you do, but at least you are gonna get as close as possible to uh, not screwing it up. So I finish one side and then I have to create a mirror of the other side. So that's where I end up with. Uh, I have a nice metal straight edge. I'm uh, measuring it on each side of the, the piece and then going from there as opposed to uh, trying to line up the edge of the ruler um, to see if it's gonna be straight. That never seems to work. So I <laughs> uh, measure both sides, put a line between them and then start filling things in. And I also like to put uh, a label on each sheet on the inside where it's gonna be painted or covered, telling me which one it is. So that's another um, option for you, another thing that you can do to try to keep track of everything. Cause once you start cutting on it, it's gonna just turn out to be, it's all wood. 
you know you're not going to remember where anything is and a lot of your notes are going to be cut off of it so try to keep your notes within a space that uh, you can use measure it with the full stack of cards again making sure everything's where it needs to be it is about the width of my thumb and that's all it really needs to be I can stick a finger in there if I need to if I think I'm going to lose a piece then uh, the card well will be plenty big for that. So, more measuring. Let's speed it up a little bit more. All right, so there I go. I made a mistake, got an eraser. Um, it's easy to do, but at least I'm in this section and I don't have to worry too much about it. So, uh, those erasers are handy. If you have any from grammar school, then great. If you don't, they come in a big old pack full of mechanical pencils from Costco usually, and that's how I end up getting it. So keep the models around for measurement um, for a little bit, and then you'll probably want to put them away while you're working on stuff just so they don't get broken. Um, uh, at this point, I was a little concerned about having the height uh, being correct, and that's why I still had them out, but yeah. And there I go, setting up the back. The front's going to be open. It just makes things a little bit easier to grab the figures out. And I'm also going to have the um, box top being so snug that uh, I really don't need to worry about having a front for the figures. You can do that if you want. If you want to create a little section, uh, then you might want to also miter... I, what I call the shelf, which is the mid uh, top part where the models sit on top of. And uh, you can set that up if you like, and you'll also likely need to dado it in order to fit the, what I refer to as ribs, which are the sections in the, the middle. I'm sure there is a technical term that artisans have been using for thousands of years, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> so I'm lucky enough just to know dado. And uh, if someone will tell you uh, who has more carpentry experience what those technical terms are, then use that as your as your best um, as your best practice. So more measuring. And here I am starting to uh, consider where those dados need to go. And I have a different instead of the loop de loops, I use slashes. That is uh, my own personal. Uh, language to myself of what I need to do um, and telling me where to make the marks and to set the machine. Each time I set the marks where they need to go, I consider that the width of the blade is going to be one eighth of an inch. It's the same width of the material and uh, that's another consideration of why I use this material specifically is it just makes things like that easier because if I do run a simple dado then um, I, I don't have to worry about um, the MDF fitting within it. It just kind of slides in and it's never really been a problem. Uh, MDF sucks up moisture real bad. So uh, when you start gluing and other things like that, it will swell. So just keep that in mind if you're going to use different materials. Uh, you might need to add uh, a little bit of distance for tolerance back and forth and things can get a little complicated when you do that. Uh, but for me, this works just right. So I'm just putting all of my pieces, the amount of space that I need, then a blade width, and then the space that I need and a blade width, and making all my measurements based on that. I think I'm about at the point where I'm making the outer box measurements. Um, the cool thing about the outer box is everything's mirrors of each other. So uh, as long as you get the top measured correctly, then the sides are the same. So the left and right side and the front and back side will be mirrors of each other. So I don't have to draw all the stuff on top of those. I just have to make sure that when I do the cuts that they will be uh, matched and it will work that way pretty well. So um, that's what I'm doing as fast as possible in warp speed drawing everything in and making sure it's all all set up. I like to have everything drawn out. The only thing I don't have drawn out is the ribs, uh, as I call them, which are the 
the parts that create the sections where the um, separations are between the lion and the other four models. And the reason for that is things are going to change once I get out into the uh, table saw and things are going to be imperfect, uh, imprecise, stuff's going to change up and I know that I'm going to make some mistakes and things are going to be a little weird. So what I'm going to try to do is just make it to the end cut once I get out there using the scraps. And I have more than enough uh, left from the scraps to make that happen. And here I am out on the saw. I've got everything set up. I'm in the sunlight, all that kind of fun business. I've got my pieces, as you can see. I'm setting up my gate. Um, I am not using all of the safety features of the saw. As you can see, the only real safety feature I have is that I'm turning it off as I move between the pieces and I'm setting stuff up and measuring between it. The safety equipment is there. I'm just, I found it easier for me to work not using the safety equipment. And you should definitely use the safety equipment if you can. And if there's, like I say, a carpenter or something out there, listen to their advice. Uh, I'm just doing what I can to keep my fingers away from the blade. Um, this is a, not a standard construction blade. This is one that has got more teeth on it. They're not that expensive, but it does make a nicer cut, especially on this uh, smaller material. Uh, otherwise, it would just get torn up. Um, as you can see, I'm keeping my excess pieces separated from my uh, other pieces. The stuff I'm still working on as best I can. And the reason for that is you're almost always going to need it. So keep it separate, but keep it. And you'll notice I also switched the uh, blades, the blade over to a 45 degree angle. I uh, rotated it, which is one of the features of this table saw. Um, it's pretty precise on the gate, and that's what I use for everything. One of the things you might not expect that you need to do is when it tilts like that, um, the uh, you need to uh, you need to figure out that it's going to change at a 45 degree angle, um, but your measurement where you wanted it to end is at the uh, furthest point of that angle. So what you actually have to do is reduce by a blade length the um, actual measured distance, and uh, that will account for the 45 degree tilt. So that's called a miter. So everything that I measured out, I will set the table to the measurement that I measured out to, and then I will reduce it by the eighth of an inch, three millimeters, whatever you're using, wherever you're at. Um, in order to make the measurements the same. That's another reason why when I say things are going to change, it's because of there's a little bit of imprecision. That math should work out fine, but it's just how, how it ends up working. Um, and sometimes I want to get really close to the blade or make uh, you know some per imperfect changes. <laughs> um, those are the types of adjustments I'm doing here. And what I like to do is make as long a cut as possible, maintaining the scraps in as large of pieces as possible, and that's the order of cuts that I do, just to keep anything else from going crazy. Um, the box part, the outer box part, is the simplest. It's just a bunch of straight cuts. There's no datoing that needs to be done. So what I try to do is get that part done first, and then I go put it in the garage and I stop thinking about it. Um, so that's what I'm doing here, getting it uh, all set up so that all of the miters end up matching. There is only the top of the box that would need a miter on all four sides. I've screwed up a lot in the past putting too many miters on things and there's usually only three that you need for this application. Um, and it's only for the top of the box. Everything else seals up but has one edge left with uh, the manufacturer's, um, like I said, straight edge left intact to keep anything else uh, crazy from happening. So, there's a, speaking of crazy things that are going to happen, uh, you'll see when I start doing the dados, um, these are very small pieces of wood. 
I mean, an eighth of an inch is tiny, and sometimes it'll get stuck under the gate. I have yet to solve that problem, but uh, my biggest way to cope with it is to not care and to hide it later on with black paint and felt. <laughs> So uh, you may see me get stuck uh, as I'm moving across, and uh, I'm aware of it. I'm, I just, uh, I've just used it enough, I just don't care. Um, there's other ways to fix it and, and move on from there. So, yeah. Uh, what am I doing? I think I'm stacking things looking for a place to put everything. Yeah. So I'm just trying to clean up, get everything out of the way. Uh, it's easy to get confused, especially when you start cutting pieces, because the stuff that you've cut that's excess will have marks from your pencil, and it might confuse you thinking that it's a finished piece or not a finished piece, and it's best just to get it out of the way uh, as quickly as you can so that you can focus on the stuff that you're, you're doing next. And try to do the minimum number of measurements, so if there is uh, anything that has the exact same measurement, uh, try to do those at the same time just so that they're consistent so all of the edges match up. If you try to go measure it back again there's going to be a small deviation and it's going to be huge when you try to go glue everything up and it'll drive you crazy. So just do what you can, tighten it down um, so that the gate doesn't move and knock out everything you can uh, that's of the same measurement at the same time. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Uh, so I'm stacking things uh, and restacking things constantly in order as I'm double checking to make sure that I don't have anything else it that requires that same measurement. So, yeah. Not a lot to say about saws other than, you know, they move fast, they uh, are very sharp, they will eat your fingers, so keep your fingers away from the blade. Uh, and I don't know if there's another tool, maybe, that I haven't figured out which one it should be. I mean, if you like glue it down into, or tape it down to another piece of wood, maybe, that allows you to uh, maintain uh, pressure in an even capacity as it moves across the table. I think other people just end up using larger thicker pieces of wood that are stronger that you don't have to push down with quite as much force. Um, but I do have to sometimes get a little close to the blade and uh, go from there. That is the edge. It looks like I did the wrong one, but that's the one that I used as uh, my first piece that I wrote all my measurements and everything down on uh, and before I started uh, looking at pieces that could be finished and that ends up being um, the top of a box or something and that's why it looked like I'd done the wrong side hadn't actually done the wrong side but it kind of looked that way so what's the next thing we're gonna do we are gonna rotate the blade back to 90 degrees get a little closer and start the dados so uh, here's a safety feature that you may not be aware of you can move the blade down and that's what I'm doing here I'm uh, adjusting it so that it's around half the height of the width. There's probably a precise way of measuring it, but I don't know what that is. So I just eyeball it as much as I can, try to get it halfway there, and then I'm going to hit it with the, uh, the wood and see where it goes. Still trying to keep your fingers away, but as you see how I keep getting jammed in the, the gate, it's just going to happen. Um, and I was unhappy with the uh, depth of the cut. I needed to go up just a little tiny bit and uh, make an adjustment. You probably will have to do the same. Um, it's going to hurt you a lot less if it's not high enough to uh, cut a finger off. But that doesn't mean it's not going to chew on you. So do what you can to keep something between you and the blade. Um, and I'm keeping the wood between me and the blade here. Uh, I'm sure there's another another good tool for, for what I'm trying to do. Maybe, like I said, holding down a, a block of wood on top of it and moving it across. But um, yeah, I didn't really think of that at the time. 
I'm going to start speeding this up as a process. I know it takes a while, and hopefully it's not too boring with me yammering on, but, you know, that's the point, isn't it? Um, make sure you are constantly checking um, where the stuff is going to line up, uh, the same as you did if you, when you're checking it on just with the pencil. Um, because one little tiny slip, uh, something slides under the gate, anything like that, and I mean, you're going to have it not line up. But if the gate doesn't move, then you should be okay. One of the things to keep in mind, though, um, when it's low, when the blade's so low like this, you can go in either direction. Um, you can cut pulling towards you, you can cut moving away from you, and it will still uh, make a nice cut. So, um, depending on the orientation that you need for the measurements, uh, whatever the pieces are, then uh, just cut off what you need. And here I am making the rib pieces. Um, so, uh, the distance had been set because of the, the inner shelf, and I knew that the ribs would be the same width as the inner shelf. So what I did was I um, just cut them halfway through uh, from excess pieces and then made measurements from there uh, with the uh, rest of the, the size of the shelf and the height of the remaining, um, I call it like the model well or the, the model volume and, and uh, that allowed me to make these um, I don't know what to call them, but they made the ribs so that they would fit um, sliding down one way, and then I put in a notch, and it would slide in the other way, um, and it would all line up from tab A into slot B kind of format. I don't know the names, but I know it worked, and that's why I did it this way. So, um, let's see. Let's speed things up again. And... There I am making uh, the very small dado cuts and it keeps getting stuck. So what I do is I try to go reverse and do whatever it takes to get a nice straight uh, dado out of there. Um, a very, there's a very, very small section that's actually cutting. Um, and I'm not sure if there's another way to adjust that gate so that it gets closer to the uh, table or maybe there's an imperfection in the table but that's one of the things that maybe I'll have to fix later but um, yeah it ends up getting all kinds of uh, wonky on me I'm still keeping my fingers away from it but I have to make like really weird adjustments and some of it's gonna look a little bad but everything that looks bad is actually gonna be covered up by felt so like I said again planning that out from the beginning um, made it a lot easier so I don't have to worry about it and I'm just putting in last adjustments to make the last um, cuts on the ribs so that they're the right height and then there's one more rib to make and that's the one in the center and I wanted to make it have a notch so I wanted there to be um, I tore off the excess uh, and I made it to the, the right uh, dimension in one way from what I had left. And I'm going to cut just a tiny little bit off of it to make it look like it's um, it's fitting well into the... Uh, it's a tab basically that fits into the slot. Little tiny adjustments, little tiny moves, and it'll all end up working out at the end. As you can see, I only went about halfway. And then... Um, yeah, I'm making uh, measurements. There it goes. So you can see how it all fits in. It doesn't have to go all the way through. I just kind of needed it to get as close as possible. And when those two half cuts manage to come together, it will uh, line up perfectly in the right space, in the right spot. Now I took everything up, 
I got my glue, I got my different pieces to hold everything together, and I've got my uh, pieces of wood. So uh, it's Bond 3, I think, is the, it's the whatever super strong wood glue. Tri Tight Bond 3 Ultimate Wood Glue is what I ended up using. Uh, interior, exterior, and waterproof. Hopefully I won't have to deal with any of that. There will be some additional waterproofing with some Mod Podge in a minute. But uh, one thing is, the MDF sucks up moisture so much. It is such a dry material that um, it's going to suck up glue really quickly. Um, the only way to really get around that is to work really quickly. I have these little um, hardware store uh, right angle pieces for working on fences. And they're the straightest right angle things that I've ever found to be able to hook to. And my process generally is to set some glue, put um, this beautiful uh, right angle piece. This is where the camera started to screw up, so you're going to miss a little bit of this. Uh, right up against everything, measure it out so that it, it fits as well as possible, and then clamp it down. And do that on both sides as much as you can. Um, always checking to make sure that uh, you don't have any weird spaces or anything like that. Just, you know, you're going to have to just do the best you can. As the MDF starts to absorb the glue, it's going to warp a little bit, and that can make things a bit of a challenge. But the glue is very strong, so if you kind of get it even, then uh, good enough is good enough sometimes. Um, and the reason why I use the metal pieces is the glue doesn't really stick to it, so... Uh, they pop right off with just, a, sometimes you need a screwdriver, but it works out pretty well. Um, and I use another piece of wood that I'm not gluing it uh, with in order to measure and make sure that uh, the pieces are even as best you can get. And then clamp it down and set it there. And come back in about an hour. I'm not going to film the glue drying because, I mean, I'm sure I'm boring enough as post trying to vamp while glue is drying and work on other pieces you can see I got a box full of clamps I got a bag of different right angled pieces so um, just try to work with what you can get as many pieces done as you can and that will help you uh, maintain some strength I've got some other right angled pieces I could have used but they're um, a little harder for this little tiny stuff uh, so I ended up just using these um, spring clamps instead of the ones that are the screw type to hold the, the 90 degrees together. Um, yeah, the I think they're shelf pieces, the tiny ones that I'm using right now. There's like the shelf pit piece, there's the fence piece. I've got all different types of them. They were maybe a dollar for a bag, and uh, I had a bunch of different projects I was working on at uh, one time. So. I think it was for this Kingdom Death uh, box stuff. I ended up buying a whole host of them. And uh, you can see what I did with them there. And that's where the camera froze. And we're just going to do a time jump from there. And there we are. After everything has been drying for a little while, we've gotten a little bit of progress. Dr uh, glued in the rib pieces for the top and some of the sides. And it all went basically through the same process of clamping stuff down. And now I need to do uh, the final side here. So it's going to get some glue. I made uh, I had to make a quick adjustment and go back out to the saw, which made a little mistake. That's why the little notch is there. It's not the end of the world. If it bothers you, then stick a little piece of your excess um, wood in there and glue it in, and it'll work out fine. Otherwise, just shove some felt over it, and no one will know the difference. Um, okay, so here we are. More glue. If you'll notice also, I left the bottom part off. I could have glued it in, but the reason why I didn't do that is I wanted to paint it black. And the only time you're gonna have to easily have access to uh, this area is right now before you put that bottom piece on. So this last uh, edge that I'm gonna glue in here is the last piece that, see how fast it soaked up that glue? Like I had to go back over it. Um, and it rained today, so it's even humid outside and it still sucks up all the moisture that fast. Uh, so the only time you're going to have to be able to glue or to paint the interior of this is now. Uh, the reason why I don't want to use felt 
on the inside of the card well instead of uh, you know, just painting it black. The reason why I don't use felt is I don't want it to be sticky at all in that card well. I don't want to go fishing around for it. I just want to pop the uh, top off and tilt it forward and have the cards that are sleeved slide right out so I don't have to fight with it. Uh, if I were to put something that might uh, be a little harder um, to make it come out towards me, then um, I'm likely going to get a card stuck that I forgot about and didn't know about. And uh, I don't want to do that. I want to have all of the hit locations and AI cards and all that kind of stuff pop out at the same time so that I don't feel like I have to go back and fight the stupid uh, same fight over again. So here it is, the, the top piece, and I'm going to put on some glue onto the other one and check it out. It's a box. Same thing with uh, the outer box. Um, if you end up having something that's a little too deep, then now might, instead of putting that last piece on, be a good time to add felt or uh, paint something on the inside if that's what you want to do. Uh, but this is shallow enough for me that I will be able to add the felt later. I put felt on the top of the box, uh, the same as the rest of the sides, just to protect the model. You don't really have to worry too much about upward forces unless you flip it over, but just in case, go from there. Uh, any glooping is going to remain a gloop when the glue dries, so you will want to kind of um, wipe away any excess if you end up with any excess and uh, go from there. Sometimes you can use the excess to fill gaps too, so it just depends on how you want to approach it. Um, just happen to have a bunch of these other larger brackets. They're not perfect, but they were good enough for what I needed it to do here. And uh, I'm going to just set it aside in a second. Go from there. You see how I still have stuff on the outside from uh, that I drew? It's because I don't care because I'm going to paint it. Speaking of paint, let's get some paint out. I have some really cheap acrylic. I have some cheap sponges. You can get yourself some cheap, um, I don't know, brushes. You can do whatever you want. And I'm going to take a look and make sure that the last thing I, I'm going to have to glue in there is measured properly and will fit right. And I didn't put anything on backwards because now is going to be uh, the last time I could peel things off if I had to do that. Um, I am going to take the bottom separately, throw some paint on there, and then just quickly give it a coat. Uh, you got to paint it now because... Uh, even before it's glued um, because uh, you won't have access later unless you have a really long sponge and you can see in the dark with x-ray vision or whatever. Uh, I try to keep away from the edges uh, just because I want the glue to be able to soak in as opposed to it being covered up by paint. And it is going to suck a lot of paint. Um, you want to act quickly so that it doesn't take too much moisture because it's going to puff up uh, from the moisture. That's just the way MDF works. It uh, is a very dry substance and it gets very weak when moisture is introduced to it. So you just want to get as little as, on, as you can only on that top area so that the rest of it, uh, the core part of it, it remains as strong as possible. And just goop it, hit it with your sponge back and forth, all the little pieces. It's going to dry super fast because the MDF that I keep talking about. And uh, speaking of drying, so some of the things it's going to be able to do is um, it's going to make your fingers super dry and maybe painful. Um, the paint will help with that so that when you're touching it and you're moving it around, there's a little bit of a barrier. Uh, primer does a better job than just the acrylic here, but I'm going to use some Mod Podge over top of it. I was using primer before, uh, latex primer, and it worked pretty well. The thing is, it's more expensive than this cheap acrylic stuff, and just use the cheap stuff. There's really not much reason uh, to do it uh, any other way, especially if you're going to use the Mod Podge to create a finish uh, on the exterior, and um, that's, you know, that's what I'm doing. And then from here, I'm just going to start flinging paint around. I want to get it on the edges. I want to get it on the creases. I want to get it 
everywhere there's a glue seam and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, even though I'm going to be putting the uh, felt in there, the felt might not match up properly and then I'm gonna it'll look all bright and brown and it'll just jump out, out at you because of the contrast with the black. So do what you can to try to get in there and hit all the little cracks. Um, goop it however you need to. The sponge is gonna absorb a lot of paint so you can keep pressing against the uh, the edges and some of it will seep out and that will help you get whatever you need done. Um, just keep moving around. If you have a little too much on your uh, sponge or brush, then that's why I go and do the outsides around the same time. Just you know, wipe it down and then uh, try to keep moving moving the paint somewhere so it doesn't settle and pool in any particular spot. So just keep moving it around. Try to get those uh, coats as thin as you can, but still get them. And as you move it around, you'll see like those little spots in the corners um, that are hard to get to. So the Sponges kind of sucked because they're cheap. I think I got them from Amazon, uh, and then I went and picked up some other ones that sucked more from Harbor Freight. <laughs> so uh, a brush, if you're really gonna go crazy on it, then uh, a brush would probably be good for the corners uh, when you get to that point. I like getting the edges also in black, um, and just to get everything as best I can, all the different sides. And then it needs to get glued. So that was the last little bit of it getting glued. Um, now it's just a box. It's just a pretty, pretty box. And once this glue is done, then uh, it's pretty much the end. Uh, the whole thing will be complete, except for the little finishing things that you may or may not decide to do yourself. Um, there are a couple different ways of doing this once all four sides are on it. If you want to, you can keep pressure on it. I'm going to test it out and see if a weight will uh, help keep things where they need to go. And it turns out that wasn't very good for um, the little slight deviations in per being imperfect uh, holding the, the box together. So I ended up having to go and get the clips on it. But uh, a little bit of weight generally will help you keep the pressure on it and uh, seal it so you don't have to hold it with your hands like I did eventually I went and got the clips then we have all this cool stuff um, as you can see still got my ruler but now I've brought out my adhesive felt as you can see the uh, adhesive backing and a paper slicer this is a precision paper slicer from Amazon for like 10 bucks and it works pretty well at cutting the felt so that's what I like to use it for all you need is a ruler and you can kind of get an idea you can measure it in inches if you use inches but millimeters is more precise and since this is going to be uh, something that you really need um, precision for and it's very small go metric fellas it's not going to kill you there's metric and there's uh, standard depending on however you want on the paper slicer there so uh, just set it to whatever you think it needs to be. Go in there and you know measure it up to wherever the line's at. I think I was going to like four and a sixteenth at the time, doing my best to figure out where that's at, and then just slide it up, and you have a nice precise cut. So. I was able to then slip it in there and then if you if you get it in there towards the edge best you can do you can run your fingers against the other edge and put a crease and that's where uh, you make your next cut so little trick hopefully it helps if you got longer fingernails or any fingernails you didn't cut them down to nubs then uh, it will be helpful for you uh, to be able to use that trick. And then the rest of this time, most of it is going to be me trying to peel the backing off. <laughs> That's just going to happen. Uh, one of the things I do is I, I try to get it as close to square as I can, and then I peel a little tiny bit of the backing, 
and then try to move my fingers down and through but I got big ass hands so I'm not that delicate um, but I'll, I'll just edge and push the edge uh, with my fingertips as much as I can pulling the backing off and that will help me get uh, as tight a corners as I can um, otherwise you can just try to cut it and then just put it on flat surfaces but for me it was uh, a little easier this got a little stupid wrinkle in it and I had to redo it but uh, just keep pushing against those edges and you will stick the felt on all of it and that is the basic technique for everything I'm going to do so I'm just going to put it into warp speed how's that sound and there we go uh, and just keep working it working it working it uh, there's a couple different types of felt that I was able to get from Amazon with the adhesive backing one was like a jeweler's felt and for this application it seemed to be okay and the other one was a little bit thicker um, and that part was fine too the uh, both will protect whatever it is that you want to create if you're making boxes to keep your stuff in uh, I have a dirty hairy Smith & Wesson um, 44 mag that my grandfather uh, gave to me uh, as an inheritance and he bought it like when Dirty Harry was the big thing so it was in the 70s so for close to 50 years this felt was in there and it is basically the same stuff as what I'm putting with this adhesive and it deteriorated <laughs> entirely so this isn't uh, an infinite solution uh, by any means to the problem of um, setting up your your boxes of stuff uh, at some point like a pool table you may have to go in and refelt it but um, for now it works out pretty well and uh, shouldn't get anything on your uh, your stuff there shouldn't be any adhesive sticking up you should have everything lined up as much as you can and as long as your um, miniatures don't have any parts that uh, stick out above the the last section that you are able to put the felt down onto then um, if you don't get it all the way to the top it shouldn't be that big a deal try to get it to wherever the most um, mass from your model is uh, uh, up to that height and it'll probably be okay um, but I try to get all the different sides you see me running my fingers down in and uh, also getting all of the model wells because that's what's gonna be important um, when the sides are all the same length then I'm doing what I can to make multiple cuts of the same length and I have nothing better uh, as a solution to you to peel the backing off of this thing just get in there with your fingertips turn it around and get another side if one side's not working right a lot of times uh, I'll be peeling on it and the felt will come off and it'll leave the adhesive behind <laughs> and I'll have to go to another corner and uh, try to go from there so if you see my hands leave the screen it's because they're going up to my face trying to see if I can peel off the stupid backing and there's no expertise to it you just keep doing it it's just how the technology works and of course there's gonna be a plane so we'll just let that go and the soothing tones of some propeller moving across or helicopter there's a propeller so it's one of the two it's late at night so it's not Bill Burr it's probably somebody coming from an airport nearby in Long Beach um, alright so there we go keep going I pull out a sculpting tool in order to get way down in there when my fingers are too uh, thick and and then there was one section where um, it kind of uh, it just didn't go far enough and it didn't get into the the crease well enough so I cut it with the exacto blade and then uh, pushed everything where it was supposed to go you can't tell because everything's in black <laughs> and that's the magic of painting it all black first so 
There we go. It's almost all in there. You could also take a marker, and I will take a dry erase marker in a second on the last little bits of finishing and uh, cover up anything else that doesn't quite uh, get covered or wasn't covered in paint. But it's looking pretty good. Nobody's going to look at it this closely or make any extra changes after that point. I've only got one tiny strip left. Um, so, do my last adjustment. Fill it in there. Stick it in. Um, yeah, there we go. I can get it back on camera. There you go. So, as I said, a lot of those little spots that were not uh, covered by paint now are covered by felt. And the whole box, the whole thing, feels a lot easier to hold because it's not sucking all the moisture out of my fingertips. So, it's also swollen a little bit, and it might come back down as any other extra moisture uh, leaves, but it should be pretty close to fine. Next thing to do is let's do the top. So, cut out a nice piece. I don't really do the edges unless I have to, if, if it's too sloppy. Um, and the box on the inside just plops right out, then I'll put felt on the inside, but otherwise I'll only do the top just to protect any models that may bump against the top for whatever reason, transport, or who knows, it's an earthquake country, things can fall out. So uh, it's a little tight, and I can't get the inner box out. So uh, what I ended up doing is uh, sanding the corners down and made it work. Uh, what's next which which one do I have here as you can see there is um, a lion attached to the box so how did I do that I just printed I went and got, hit the scanner because I have a scanner and the little leaflet package that comes with uh, the instructions I scanned that in and then on some photo paper I printed out the uh, picture and it's a five by seven uh, picture and it was a five inches across box so it all I may used I used the borderless printing function in order to make it work and that's what happened here um, as you can see I've got satin Mod Podge sitting there next to me and I will be using that to cover the uh, whole outer box in the satin Mod Podge and that will add the waterproof barrier and it will um, also make it easier to hold so it'll suck less moisture out of your hands and I will put that on both the top part of the outer box and the bottom part of the inner box and that will be the whole thing so yeah that's basically the whole construction pretty simple um, took me a day to do it all, but it only took me a day to do it all because of the extra time cost of filming. And now I'll be able to take this box, pretty as she is, over and uh, play the game through on part three. So that was our whole um, goal, was to start assembly in part one, do a little paint job over there, then we got the nice box that only I do. You can skip if you don't want to do it and um, you'll see how it all goes together and why this box is useful when I set everything up for the Giga Lion next. I don't know when the video will come out so if you want to subscribe you can set up notifications you'll know every time I put up more videos. Um, you can also uh, I think you can subscribe to the playlist and you will definitely find the um, Kingdom Death stuff in the Kingdom Death playlist so that should make it helpful for you if not every week I put out an informative video of a little bit smaller length than this uh, telling you every single campaign that's coming out in the role-playing games and tabletop board games space um, 
from Kickstarter and any other of uh, the crowdsourcing uh, formats I could find. And if you, you're like, oh, I don't want to buy from Kickstarter or anything like that, there are plenty of news sites to tell you about the retail things you can go, or you can just go to a store and find out about it. But with Kickstarter, you have to know a year or two in advance uh, in order to pick it up in time. And that can be difficult for a lot of people. So I keep you up to date. I keep you informed. And if you want to subscribe, then uh, you can be informed too. And hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, if you find it useful, if you're going to be interested in how I'm playing the Giga Lion, throw a thumbs up. That's also helpful. Um, for whatever reason, I always say they're my most popular videos, but nobody ever shows appreciation on them when I do the paints and the builds and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we need to change that. So be cool. Be cool to the people that make your content. And you guys have a good one. I'll see you in part three.